Welcome to Hope Awakens. I truly appreciate you joining me. You know, you're joining others, people from around the globe right now. Donna and her family are watching in Minnesota. Deborah is in beautiful St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the Caribbean. Colette is in Mauritius. Vanessa is in Guyana. Roque is in Pennsylvania. Paul and Michelle, Elkhart, Indiana. Bernard is in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. Donna is in Kauai, Hawaii. Tanik in San Salvador Island in the awesome Bahamas. Joshua is in Maasai Mara National Park in Kenya. Seth is joining us from Nigeria. Buzz is in Columbia, Maryland. And Scott is in Patchogue on Long Island, New York. Thank you. And thank you for being part of Hope Awakens. This is Hope Awakens, brought to you by It Is Written. I'm John Bradshaw, and we've been asked, and uh, I've got to tell you that, yes, DVDs of these Hope Awakens presentations are available. All you've got to do is go to itiswritten.shop. You'll see the Hope Awakens tab, and all you need to know is right there. Itiswritten.shop. You can access it 24-6. Now, second thing I'd like to tell you about, very important. After Hope Awakens continues... I would love for you to plug into one of our Hope Awakens communities. I've got someone here who's going to tell us a whole lot more about Hope Awakens communities. One of our Hope Awakens community facilitators, Jeremy Arnold. Jeremy, welcome to Hope Awakens. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I'm really glad you're here. Tell me what a Hope Awakens community is. You know, a Hope Awakens community is just a safe place for people to come together We'll do it online, and it will be a way for them to ask questions, have a, a chance to go over the same topics that we have heard in your presentations, and it's just a safe place. You know, I grew up hearing these messages, and every time I hear them, I learn something new, and it's been the same with your presentations, which have served as a blessing. And so this will give them a chance. I can only imagine what it's like. It's the first time you've heard this. This will be a safe place to ask questions, to hear what you've learned as repetition deepens impression. So how do people get involved, yeah. Jeremy? Well, they can respond to an invite if they receive an invite in their email or, or if they get a text or a phone call. If not, they can go to hopeawakens.com and they can uh, sign up there. Fantastic. Jeremy Arnold, really appreciate it. Thanks for being part of Hope Awakens Communities as a facilitator. God be with you. Thank you. Appreciate that a lot. Remember, hopeawakens.org is where you ask questions. And to ask your questions now, here's Pastor Doug Naar. Hey, John, good to be here with Hope Awakens and also our viewers. Again, like every night, we have some very good questions. And here's the first one. You mentioned a few nights ago about the 144,000 that I mentioned in the book of Revelation. Now, does that mean that there's a limited amount of uh, of people in heaven? Absolutely not. Anyone can be in heaven by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That's just the amount of people who are saved and alive when Jesus comes back. Don't worry. There's plenty of room for you. Where is Mary, the mother of Jesus? Is she deceased in the grave or did she ascend into heaven? You know, when I was a little boy, I was taught that Mary ascended to heaven and it was celebrated every August the 15th, the Feast of the Assumption. Nope. Mary is not in heaven. Mary is sleeping in the grave along with all the other sleeping saints. Now, what if you were cremated when you die? What would there be to resurrect from the grave? Yeah, we're missing the point a little bit. God, uh, at the resurrection, Jesus is not going to be scratching around in the dirt looking for something to put back together. In the resurrection, we are given new bodies. Cremation, however you are, whatever ends up happening to you, it's not going to prevent Jesus from giving you a new body. Don't worry about that. Is it required that someone in the family be the spiritual leader? And what if there's none? Well, it certainly is a good idea. The, the, the father, the way it was set up in the beginning, ought to be the, the house band, the husband, the spiritual leader. But like you said, sometimes there's none. So you might want to be delicate about this. If perhaps you're a child and neither parent is involved spiritually, you might have to be your own spiritual leader. But yeah, if no one steps up, you might want to work it out one way or the other for sure. Now, God promises the Holy Spirit to us. 
is it really necessary that we ask for the Holy Spirit every single day? Why, sure it is. We're in a relationship with God. You don't just say to your spouse, I love you, you know, once, and then the rest of the week you forget all about it. At least you shouldn't. And, and what, what this reminds us of is that faith in God is a connection, you know, a connection. And so daily you are asking God to fill you again, fill you. Don't worry if you forget, but I'd say you ought not. We commit our lives to God on a daily basis. That's the way to do it. Part of that is asking the presence of God in our life. And Jesus comes into our life through the Holy Spirit. Now, John, if someone were to hurt me and I forgive them in my heart, but they don't know that, I, that they hurt me, should I let them know that they hurt me or should I just let it go? Well, that depends on the situation. You know, sometimes you should because maybe to prevent them from hurting somebody else or maybe they did real harm. Pray about it. Sometimes it is just better to let it go and not make a big thing into a bigger thing or a small thing into a big thing. It really depends on the situation. I would encourage you to follow God's leading. Sometimes, certainly, it's right to speak up, no doubt. Will God's people be on earth during the seven last plagues and will they be protected from it? Ah, two questions. As a matter of fact, yes, God's people will be on the earth during the seven last plagues, and yes, they will be protected. In Egypt, there were 10 plagues, but the seven last plagues saw God's people protected. This is why uh, John in Revelation says, the seven last plagues, he's directing us back there. There'll be seven, God's people will be on the earth, and God's people will be protected during that time. Why don't we see prophets today like there was in the Bible times? Well, here's what I want to encourage you to do. Go to our message on hopeawakens.org and the previous presentations. Watch A Place of Safety, and you'll see that indeed God has given the gift of prophecy in the end of time. Now, Joel said that there would be the gift of prophecy in earth's last days. So it is God's plan that the gift of prophecy would exist. Now, the challenge is you get people say, I have the gift of prophecy. And someone says, did you not hear about that woman in Timbuktu who has a... No, we will know. Folks won't promote themselves. It'll be recognized. False prophets and false claims you really want to steer clear of. We have a question here from a student missionary who said, I've prayed that God might open the doors if he wants me to go out and, and uh, proclaim the gospel. I looked at the coronavirus as a major sign as God closing the door. Am I interpreting this correctly? Maybe, maybe not. Only God can tell you. Speak to uh, spiritual leaders around you, but take your cue from God. It might be that you know that people have uh, gone in mission service and given their lives for years and years and years and years. Uh, there's no reason to suggest that a virus must stop you, but you may have practical considerations. So think about it. Pray about it. This coronavirus isn't going to last forever. We hope, we hope we'll get our way through this. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, follow God, but... I hope you won't prevent a pandemic from uh, letting God use you to do some great work for Him. But again, I'm not telling you to go. You've got to pray your way through this and speak to the people around you who have experience and a close walk with God. How long can we watch the Hope Awakens series when it's over? Well, I, you know what I've got to tell you? I, I didn't suggest that that question be asked. This is a, a, is a real question. Forever and ever and ever and ever. Well, it's, you're going to find the presentations on hopeawakens.org and on It Is Written TV. So they'll be there for a good long time. Now, in the Garden of Eden, why did the serpent allow Satan to use, uh, to use it to tempt Eve? I don't know that the serpent allowed much of anything. I don't think the serpent raised his hand, uh, figuratively speaking, and said, I'll do the job. I think you'll find that somehow Satan sort of... Um, pressed the point, forced the issue, but this, this wasn't voluntary. Why did Eve become so gullible to the serpent before she took her first bite? I got another question. Why do so many of us become so gullible to the devil day in and day out? And here's the answer. Eve wandered away from God's advice. God said, don't do that. Eve went right on. She should have stayed away from the tree. She went to the tree. It was a gradual thing. Once you step off the platform of the Word of God, there's only one way to go. Eve showed us where we go. Pastor John, are chickens unclean? Do we still have to follow the clean and unclean? Because I heard now that we have refrigeration, we can eat whatever we want. 
Yeah, that was told you by someone who's a big fan of uh, catfish or pork. <laughs> Chickens, for some reason, are clean. I don't know why, uh, but biblically speaking, they're clean. Do we need to follow? No, we don't. We don't have to follow. We want to follow because God says, this is my will. I don't do anything because I have to. Jesus is my Lord. He's my Savior. I want to. It is a biblical thing. Refrigeration. You, you take a pig out of the yard and put him in a fridge, still a pig, and it's still unclean. So I would like to encourage you. Don't look at, oh my, how will I get by without lobster? No, no. They're just like bugs that crawl on the bottom of the ocean anyway, eating dead stuff. Thank God He wants to help you and bless you. What are people doing right now in heaven? Yeah, really good question. My question would be, what in the world are people doing right now in heaven? We know that Moses is there, Elijah is there, Enoch is there, and likely a group of people who are resurrected at the death of Jesus. Other than that, uh, there are no people there because the rest are sleeping in the grave. What are they doing there? I don't know, but I imagine it would be fantastic, whatever it is. Now, here's our last question for tonight. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, I read that if we sin willfully after knowing the truth, then there is no more sacrifice for our sins. Now, Pastor John, does this mean that I am lost forever? Imagine if it did. All right, let's think about that. No, it does not mean you're lost forever. Uh, this is talking about someone who persists in sin, refusing to repent. No, 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 no. Otherwise, we're saying once you come to a knowledge of truth, once you come to know Jesus, if you slip up, it's out of here for you. No, God is gracious. He's good. He gives to us the gift of repentance. We want to grow. We want to, you know, forget about those bad habits and take Jesus on more and more. But please don't ascribe that kind of characteristic to God. God is not like that. He is merciful and he is gracious. Doug, thank you for the questions tonight. Very good tonight. questions. Very good questions. Appreciate that. You can get your questions to us at hopeawakens.org. I've got a special guest tonight. His name is Pastor Michael Harp. He is an author, a teacher, a pastor. Now, he has a special emphasis in the area, uh, or, or should I say, expertise in the area of stewardship. Pastor Michael Harp, thank you for joining me. Hey, how you doing? Doing great. I'm glad you're here. Explain to me what stewardship is and why it's important. Uh, coming from the biblical perspective, uh, the Bible, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2 says, um, Moreover, it is required in stewards to be faithful. Uh, uh, th that's the word steward. Uh, steward is, means a manager. Um, stewardship is management. Well, management of what? A lot of times we think of stewardship as the first thing that comes to our mind is money or tithe and offering. But uh, stewardship is actually life management. It's the management of our entire life. And also it is in relationship with the great God of heaven. Uh, and so uh, first and foremost, stewardship is a relationship between the steward, which is me, the, the, the manager and the sovereign God of heaven. Okay, that, that frames it in a really special way. Now, you mentioned there as part of that tithing, tithes and offerings. Explain that for me. Uh, you know what? Many of us learn uh, or, or, or we associate stewardship with tithe and offering because in a church service, uh, you know, they pass the offering plate and uh, people put money in, tithe and, and offering. And what happens is we, we mentally begin to think that this is all stewardship is. But that's, that's not the case. Uh, stewardship, it, or as, as it relates to tithe, when, when uh, the Bible says, you know, bring you all the tithe into the, into the storehouse. Well, uh, it is more than just the, the liturgical section of worship. It is my entire life. Tithing is, is a part of it. And really, tithing is tied into my relationship with him. And what I mean by that is if I love the Lord, who is my guide, then I will lovingly want to assist him or partner with him in spreading the gospel. And that's what the tithe does. It helps us spread the gospel around the world. And so this wonderful message that saved the Jesus that saved me, I want to partner with him to fund the message 
to go around the world to, to do what you're doing to help people meet Jesus and so, take them to the king. So tell me what the blessings of tithing are. Oh, my. Uh, whew, there are so many. I mean, that, that text in Malachi 10 promises that the windows of heaven, as a matter of fact, that's the one place in the Bible that God guarantees that if, if you do this, I will open the windows of heaven. It's not, it's not guessed that this will happen. It's not, well, you know, maybe I'll bless you. This, this is a guarantee. Uh, and um, when I, re I remember my wife and I years ago, uh, you can see up here that a lot of my hair is gone now, but years ago when we were students uh, at Oakwood, <laughs> I see you too. Hey man. We, we, we were uh, on a very meager income, but uh, we learned to trust God. We would reserve, set aside the tithe, and not only just the tithe, but the offering too. And, you know, for uh, the worship segment, of course, of church. And I remember there were times when the cupboards were kind of empty and, uh, you know, the funds were low. And, you know, we were tempted. Well, you know, we have this money set aside. Let's let's use this to, to get to get some food because we're hungry. <laughs> but uh, uh, but God is so good. We would uh, we would hear the doorbell ring. Uh, on a couple of occasions, on a few of occasions, and open the door, and there is a huge box of food. And then you see a car speeding off in, in the distance, and someone has left all kinds of wonderful uh, items. And we would just sing songs and put the food on the shelves or in the refrigerator. And then if, you know, we would also share them with the other uh, uh, family students in, in, our, in our community. And so God, when he promises uh, even this last move that we just made, when he promises that he will take care of you, no one is better. Tithing is how we acknowledge God's sovereignty and his ownership. I love it. Pastor Michael Hopp, thank you so much for encouraging us. Wonderful. God bless you. Appreciate your time. My pleasure. God bless you. And thank you for having me. Thank you. It's really been a joy. And I would encourage you this. God says, put me to the test, put him to the test, put him to the test and see that when you tithe, God blesses. I know some people think 10%, how can I afford that? I would say you can't afford not to. I want to tell you about one more thing. We have got an exciting series of presentations starting in just over a month. Take charge of your health will help you to do just that. We'll be speaking to leading physicians about subjects that matter to you. We'll be talking to people who are success stories. They've taken charge so that you can learn to truly take charge of your health. And, you know, if we've learned anything at all lately, it is that our health is precious. When it's under threat, we think, wish we had good health. So it starts Monday, June 22. Take charge of your health. Practical, helpful, life-changing, life-saving. I hope you'll join me and others from around the world for Take Charge of Your Health. Come on, let's pray now. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you that we can come to you now. We do so in the name of Jesus. Guide us in your word by your spirit. Tonight, speak to us. We ask you, we pray, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. A 17th century Spanish philosopher once said, God denied to men the faculty of flight so that they might lead a quiet and, and tranquil life. For if they knew how to fly, they would always be in perpetual danger. A man named Juan Caramuel Lobkowitz said that. He said that in God's eyes, it's just better for us not to fly. Now, I don't know if the man knew about what had happened in the previous century. It is thought by some that Leonardo da Vinci built an ornithopter, a machine with flapping wings kind of resembled the anatomy of a bird. That man who painted the Mona Lisa, by the way, the Mona Lisa was painted on wood, not canvas. It's painted on a poplar plank, and it's only about this big. Anyway, that man, same man who painted the Last Supper, again, not a canvas, but a fresco, that man was quite a student of flight. Of course, he never flew. Now, it is said that a fellow named John Williams who later became the Archbishop of York, attempted to fly by leaping off the wall of Conway Castle in northern Wales, which is about 20 miles in a straight line from Liverpool. This was in the late 1500s. He was just a kid. Apparently, he was wearing a long, billowing coat. 
but his daring leap did not meet with the success that he had hoped for, assuming that the story is factual. If it's not, then at least we've got good reason to warn our children to keep their feet on the ground. But later it was the Wright brothers, Wilbur and Orville, who did what had up to that point been impossible. The brothers had owned a bicycle sales and repair shop in Dayton, Ohio. They even manufactured their own brand of bike. It was December 17, 1903, when they became the first people to successfully fly a heavier-than-air airplane at Kitty Hawk or Kill Devil Hills on North Carolina's Outer Banks. Now, some contend it was a man named Richard Pierce who flew first, a little before the Wright brothers. But seeing as he's from New Zealand, my home country, you might accuse me of a little bias, but that's what they say. I believe them. But once people got flying, there was no stopping them. Only 24 years after the Wright brothers, Charles Lindbergh became the first person to fly nonstop across the Atlantic Ocean. Took him 33 and a half hours to fly from New York to Paris. Amelia Earhart became the first woman to pilot across the Atlantic just five years later. Jets flew first in 1939. Chuck Yeager flew faster than the speed of sound in 1947. Yuri Gagarin orbited the Earth in 1961. John Glenn, later Senator John Glenn, circled the Earth three times in 1962. Neil Armstrong became the first man to set foot on the Earth, did it in 1969, July the 20th. He took one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. But now... The space shuttle went up and came back numerous times. That's now old history. In fact, John Glenn went back into space in a space shuttle mission in 1998. Now rockets go up and they come back down. And now there's talk that astronauts will travel to Mars. Just how far is it going to go? I can tell you it's going to go a lot further than Mars. John 14, we start in verse 1. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Then Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also." So look at that. One day people are going to go to heaven. No, I've never seen it. I've never been there. I haven't seen photos of heaven. Even the Hubble telescope hasn't taken pictures of heaven. But millions and millions of people believe there's a heaven, even though not one of us has been. We've never watched the heaven webcam online. All we have for the existence of heaven, as far as evidence goes, is what's written right here ink on paper in a book that we call the Bible. So is there really evidence that there's actually a heaven? Well, let's go to the Bible and find out what it says. John 6, 51, Jesus said, I am the living bread which came down from, you tell me, heaven. Jesus was convinced that heaven was a real place. And if Jesus was convinced, we can be convinced. No question. John the Baptist said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he believed it too. Jesus used the word heaven about 18 times in the Sermon on the Mount. He referred to Matthew 10 and verse 32, or he said in Matthew 10, 32, my father who is in heaven. Mark 1, we read that a voice came from heaven. It said, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Angels reported there's a heaven. In Acts chapter 1, they say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. 20 of the New Testament's 27 books mention heaven. And the book of Revelation, right here in the back of the Bible, uses the word heaven 55 times, or 56, depending on how you count. If there's actually no heaven, oh man, imagine the implications. That would mean this earth 
is all you have, so you better get what you can. Imagine that. Imagine now if there is a heaven. Oh, now we're talking. That would mean there's something after this life, after this world. Let's go back to what Jesus said, something we saw before. He said, in my Father's house, there are many mansions. I will come again and receive you to myself. He believed that there was a heaven. And he began that speech with the words, let not your heart be troubled. He knew that his disciples were living a difficult existence. They'd attached themselves to a man who was an outcast. They'd left their jobs to follow the man. And they met with constant opposition. Jesus said to them, let not your heart be troubled. At the same time, Jesus knew life was going to get a whole lot more difficult for them than it was right then. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Friend, God is saying to you tonight, when you're facing difficult times, let not your heart be troubled. Even if you're badly affected by the pandemic, let not your heart be troubled. If you're facing job loss or economic trouble, his message is still the same. Let not your heart be troubled. Now, Jesus isn't saying your situation is nothing. He's not saying you shouldn't be bothered. He's not saying it's not a struggle. He's saying, let not your heart be troubled. You see, this is the assurance Jesus gives us. These are his words. He said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He said in Matthew chapter 11, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And look at these words in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And to whom did God speak those words? He spoke them to Israel when Israel was about to enter into Babylonian captivity. You're going away into oppression for seven decades and God says to you, I have these great thoughts towards you, thoughts of peace, thoughts about you having a great future. That's because that was what was on God's mind. Their hearts didn't need to be heavy. They could trust God. Those are God's thoughts to you right now, no matter what you're going through, because God says, we're not done yet. Let not your heart be troubled. There is plenty ahead. The best is yet to come. Heaven is ahead. One day we're going to get out of this world. We're going to go to the only place that we can really call home. Well, wait, does this does this really work? Is it for real? Or was Karl Marx right when he said that religion was the opium of the people? Marx was saying that faith in God provides only illusory happiness. He said that faith in God was harmful. Well, I'd love to be able to tell Karl Marx about this, but I can't because he's sleeping in a grave in a Highgate Cemetery in North London. I'd love to be able to tell him that faith in God would provide eternal happiness fulfillment in life. But Marx is dead. Meanwhile, God is alive and well. I got an email from a friend of mine battling cancer. He was in a real fight for his life. He said, this is what he said to me. There are few things in this world that you can count on. One of them is faith in God. The other is that Jesus died to save sinners. His life was slipping through his fingers and he was able to say, it's all right because I've got eternity to look forward to. It's all right because the best is yet to come. It's all right because heaven awaits. One day we will enter into the land of the redeemed and we won't be thinking back on our hardships. We'll just say, hallelujah, God was right. Jesus is our Savior. We're in the right place now and forever. Come on now, what do you say? You ought to be able to say amen. The fact is, the fact is we need help. Human beings are broken. You know, you read about people, even Christians, who fall. It's sad. It's a shame. But we mustn't make the mistake of pointing the finger and being terribly critical because there but for the grace of God go we. And God says He can save the weak. Through Jesus, there is hope for you. Did you know that? Jesus didn't even come into the world to save the strong. He didn't come to save the good. He came to save sinners 
the broken, the faulty, the failing, the weak. The Apostle Paul prayed once that God, actually it wasn't once, he prayed that God would re relieve a serious burden. He prayed, he said, three times. And then God spoke to him, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect. Don't miss this. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Do you like that? Jesus came to save the weak. If you want to go to heaven, all you have to do is be weak. Too many people are trying to be good enough, strong enough. They're trying to be deserving enough without realizing they're just trying to get water to run uphill, trying to fly like that young boy who evidently leaped off the castle wall. Here's what God offers us. Let's look at the experience of Paul. He said this in Philippians chapter 3, For we have no confidence in the flesh. There were people in Paul's day, a lot of them, who wanted to include works of the flesh into the work of salvation. Specifically at that time, all Jewish rites such as circumcision. Paul says, no, nothing like that needs to come into the plan of salvation. We don't trust in the flesh. And not just circumcision, but anything I can do that I think would contribute to my own salvation. Anything I can do to make myself good enough for salvation. Anything I can do to earn salvation in any way. Have confidence in the flesh like that. But then Paul says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. So why would Paul say that if anyone has anything to brag about, to recommend to God, that he has more so? He explains, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of, and that's the right day, stock of Israel, right people, tribe of Benjamin, King Saul's tribe, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, rigid, concerning zeal, persecuting the law, sorry, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Not many people get to say that they are blameless concerning the requirements of the law. The laws that Paul had to follow back then, they were rigid, they were many, they were demanding. But he's able to say, I am blameless when it comes to the law. But instead of doubling down and puffing out his chest and saying that disobedience to the law sets him up to be holy in the sight of God, Paul says really the exact opposite. He says, verse 7, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Loss? Why would they be lost? These are good things. He explains, verse 8 of Philippians chapter 3, Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. His accomplishments, he said, rubbish. In some versions of the Bible, dung. Without Christ, he said, all of his goodness was not worth mentioning. And here is where Paul states his great desire. Verse 9, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Now, this is transformational. You want to go to heaven? This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where a life changes. Paul says, I don't want my own righteousness, which is all I can get by myself and by my obedience. He says, I want the righteousness I get through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God, which I get by faith. Now let's think about that because that's some 
remarkable righteousness. Paul says you may receive the righteousness of God. That is astonishing. Imagine being filled with that righteousness. Imagine being covered by that righteousness. The fact is, it's the only righteousness you can have if you want to go to heaven, if you want everlasting life. It's the only righteousness that will qualify you for heaven, the righteousness of God, and you can have it. Easy. How? Here it is. By faith, God will give you His own righteousness. That's how the plan of salvation works. You come to God through faith in Jesus. When God takes away your sin, He gives you His righteousness, and you receive it by faith, by believing, trusting. And what then? This is Philippians 3, starting in verse 10. Paul said, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. If I want to attain to the resurrection, Paul said, if I want to wake up when Jesus comes back, then I need this righteousness and not my own. So where do you think that leaves What's wrong with? Where does that leave? Well, John, everybody's doing it. Where does that leave? I don't see the problem with whatever. That just disappears. Because now you're saying, I want to simply surrender my life to Jesus. And what's the alternative? You see, someone's going to occupy the throne of your heart. It'll be either you or Jesus. And if it's you, well, you know who it really is. Now, one thing that you cannot afford to factor out of this is growth. You see, people will see flaws in their Christian experience and far too often conclude that the presence of imperfections, the presence of mistakes, means that they're not really Christians. Now, more than likely, that's not the case. It may just be that you are growing. Let yourself grow. Yes, you might be a little impatient with your spiritual growth. That might not be all bad, but you had to grow. You want to be the finished product overnight, but you have to grow. Have you seen a redwood tree or a cowrie tree or some great big tree reaching up into the sky? They start off little, but before long, they're less little. It may take a while, but they grow into the full thing. Growth. You got real battles to fight? Absolutely. As you learn to surrender your bad temper to God, as you learn to surrender your lust to God, as you learn to surrender your impatience, your gossip, your drinking alcohol to God. So look at what Paul said, same author, when he wrote to the church at Rome. Romans 6 verse 11. Likewise, Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Dead to sin, alive to God through Jesus. Then verse 16, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And this is what people miss. You want to go to heaven, but you look at yourself and all your sinful behavior and your flaws and your faults. Some people say, I can carry on sinning with impunity until Jesus comes back, but I got saved once, so that's okay. Well, I got news for you. This is deep theology. Of course not. But what's just as damaging is when people say, I got to get myself ready for heaven. I got to get myself ready for heaven. I've got to get rid of this sin. So I got to try harder and pray more and fast more. And praying and fasting is good, no doubt. But it isn't through praying more that you're going to get prepared for heaven. It's through prayer and surrendering your life to Jesus. Someone cuts you off in traffic. You want to yell. You need to yield. Someone backs into your car in the parking lot. You want to yell. 
You need to yield. God will take your vocal cords and make them a channel of blessing instead of cursing. You see something on a web page and you are tempted to click, but instead of following that impulse, yield. Send up a prayer to God like Peter did. Lord, save me. I feel myself sinking. Save me. And God does. Remember this, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You feel the compulsion to drink alcohol, and you know it's not God's will. It's not God's will for you to damage your mind, cloud your thinking, drink something that's cancer-causing. Not God's will. Lose control. Drive drunk. Act a fool. But when you're staring at that bottle, you pray to God. You yield. Lord, your will, not my will. You surrender. That's what you do. God takes your heart. He'll put that impulse in you. Yield to that impulse. He will change your impulses. He will give you grace. God puts heaven's power into your heart. Jesus doesn't just place His righteousness over you. He brings His righteousness into you. And you grow. You failed. Don't give up. You're growing. You blew it again. God is merciful. Haven't you read that? You don't think you could go a day without smoking. Okay, then. Go a minute leaning on Jesus and keep leaning on Him and go another minute. You can't go five minutes without some bad thoughts getting in your head. Of course you can't. But let me ask you, can Jesus do it in you? Yes. You got something to thank God for. Heaven isn't for good people. It's for holy people. Jesus will enter your life. He will give you His holiness, grow you more and more and more as you approach the gates of pearl. Jesus talked about the work of grace in your life as being like a seed that grows. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn. Breathe the atmosphere of heaven when you pray. Receive the Spirit in your life. Yield and grow. Believe God's, God gives you His righteousness because He does. Now, as we talk about heaven, I want to point out something. The Bible uses the word heaven in about three different ways. The Bible talks about the birds that fly in the heavens, the air. Now, that's the heavens. God told Abraham He would multiply His descendants as the stars of the heavens. So out there in space where the stars are, that's heaven too. And Jesus said, let your light so shine before men and talked about your Father which is in heaven. God's house, heaven. So you've got heavens where the birds fly, heaven where the stars are, and heaven where God is. The heaven we want to go to is a physical place, a real place, God's house. We go there when Jesus returns to take us. 1 Thessalonians 4, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Paul says the same thing to the Corinthians. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed. When? At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised. We'll be changed. He went on to talk about this change that's going to take place when this mortal puts on immortality. He says, we'll say this, or the, the saying will come to pass, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, he said, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Imagine the reunions are going to take place in heaven. Imagine being reunited with your parents in heaven. Imagine seeing friends, children, babies. Oh, come on now. Can you imagine the reunions that will take place? In this earth, we farewell our loved ones. It was never meant to be this way. Death is an intruder. You go to a cemetery with a little marker marking a baby's grave. Parents are going to see that child again. The grandparents who died, you hardly knew them. You see them again. Life doesn't end here in this world. If you have Jesus, there's an eternity stretching before us, a heaven to enjoy. What a reunion. Bible says the dead will rise up. Thank God for that. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man 
the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Borrowed from Isaiah chapter 64 when he wrote that. Imagine what it'd be like. It'll be better than that. Your wildest dreams, better than that. Most incredible place, better than that. It's as good as it gets. You won't be bored. You won't wish you were somewhere else. You won't be dissatisfied. It'll be created for your benefit, your blessing, your joy. Try, but you can't imagine how good it'll be. Better than the best vacation. Better than your dream home. Better than anything you've seen. And John saw it. Revelation 4 verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Immediately I was in the Spirit. Behold, a throne was set in heaven. One sat on the throne. He saw God's throne. He saw God Himself. So did Daniel. In Daniel 7, Daniel wrote about how he saw God the Father, the Ancient of Days, describe God's clothing and His hair and His throne, a fiery flame. He talked about the wheels of the throne. He saw multitudes of angels in this place that was heaven. Revelation 11 says, The temple of God was opened in heaven. There was seen in His temple the Ark of His Testament, which means the Ten Commandments were there. They're in the Ark of the Covenant. So when we're thinking about this, if we were ever wondering about the validity of the Ten Commandments, we know right now they exist in heaven, in the Ark of the Covenant. They're as important now as they've ever been. Well, what's Jesus doing there? Hebrews tells us, We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected. Jesus is there now as a priest, as a lawyer. Jesus is there. He invites us, come to me. You've been accused of crimes that you did commit. But Jesus is in heaven appearing for you. You friend, you're guilty. But God will pardon you and let you go free through Jesus. Amen. Heaven's focus is on this earth. Think of this vast universe. Our teeny tiny planet Earth is a speck in the universe. And yet heaven is concerned with what's happening here. Jesus' focus is not only on Earth, it's on you. Because the wages of sin is death. God is offering you life. You know, I have visited people on death row. I've seen the tears roll down their cheeks as they say they don't want to die for what they've done. Thank God we don't need to die the death penalty. While the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The lawyer is at work for you in heaven. And now we can look beyond heaven. Peter wrote, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. John said, I saw the holy city coming down, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, when you read the book of Zechariah, it says, it makes clear, Jesus will come down. His feet will touch the earth. The Mount of Olives will be like a plain and the new Jerusalem is going to sit there, right there where the Mount of Olives was. The earth will be made new and God will relocate His capital city to the scene of heaven's greatest triumph. God sees you as being as valuable as the life of Jesus. And that Jesus is coming back one day to take you to be with God. You want to go to heaven? i got news for you. God wants you to go more than you want to go. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and He will dwell with them and they shall be His people. God Himself shall be with them and be their God. This earth struggles with tragedy and loss. We deal with diseases for which we can't find a cure. Right now, planet Earth is wrestling with something. We don't know what this is going to look like tomorrow. We're hopeful. The Bible says in heaven, the inhabitants shall not say, I am sick. One day you're going to be able to throw away your medication because Jesus is coming back to a place where everyone is healthy. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any pain, for the former things are passed away. This earth represents Satan's best effort. Satan's final shot. But one day there'll be no more devil and no more sin. Revelation 22, 5. 
there'll be no night there. No night. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. The glory of the Father and of the Son illuminate the earth made new. We're going to build houses and inhabit them in the earth made new. We'll plant vineyards and eat their fruit in the earth made new. The Bible says the new earth is going to be so wonderful that the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead him. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Three verses later, Isaiah wrote, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Imagine, oh friend, you can have it. You can be there. You can dwell in this place where the streets are made of gold, where the flowers never fade. How? I'm going to tell you again. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. God offers you eternity, heaven. He says you can have it by faith. Grace forgives you and cleanses you. You can have it by faith. I, I've told this story a hundred times. If you've ever heard me tell a story, then you're blessed. You're going to hear it again. I, I was a local church pastor. Just loved it so much. Had a fantastic church. Dear lady was coming out of church. I shook her hand. That was back in the days when you could do that. I said, God bless your sister. Jesus is coming back soon. And she looked up as she was holding my hand and she said, Pastor, I hope I'll be ready. I gave her my most serious pastor look, the most serious one I could muster up. And she said, have I said something wrong? And I said, yes. I said to the next person in line, wait, don't move. I've got to deal with some business here. We stepped out of line and I said, um, what did you say? She said, am I in trouble? I said, you might be. Did you say that you hope to be ready when Jesus comes back? Oh, yes. Shouldn't I? I said, no. You shouldn't hope to be ready when Jesus comes back. Well, now, she didn't quite know what to think. And I said, you should believe that you'll be ready when Jesus comes back. I said, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Have you repented of your sins? She said, yes. I said, do you love God? Yes. You've accepted Jesus? Sure. Have you changed your mind? She said, no. I said, neither has he. Don't hope anymore. You believe. Know that when Jesus comes back, your feet will leave the ground. Know that when Jesus comes back, he will call you up. Know that in heaven tonight, there is a mansion and there is a beautiful nameplate on a door with your name written on it. Don't hope. Or oh, friend, you got to believe. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, don't wonder, will I ever be in heaven? Thank God. Thank you, Lord, that I'll be in heaven. I'm not hoping. I'm believing. Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. We are going to that land. We got to go together. A few decades back, a Soviet cosmonaut traveled up into space. She said, I flew up here into the heavens and I did not see God. Well, one day we are going up through the heavens and we're going to see Jesus and we are going to say, I am in my father's house. You know, the Egyptians, when they buried their pharaohs in the pyramids, they prepared them for the afterlife. They believed where they were going, they were going to go on living. When they found King Tut's tomb, they found flowers and chairs and all manner of things. It was thought he would need that in the afterlife. Let me tell you something for nothing. Where we are going, we'll need none of that. And I say, thank God, we go to our father's house up there. We'll spend time in heaven above. We'll be brought down here to the new earth with the redeemed throughout eternity's ceaseless ages. Jesus is coming back soon. And there's a place for you right now in your father's heart, right now. There's a place for you in heaven right now. In my father's house, there are many mansions. Claim yours right now. Heaven is for real. After heaven, we come back to the earth made new. Hard to imagine how wonderful it'll be. Reality, not a myth, a real place. You want to be there. I want to see you there. You want to be there? You want to go? It's a matter of faith. God bought your ticket. Jesus died on the cross so that you might be there with him. Now faith in Jesus lays hold on the precious gift. You say, that gift is mine. I believe it. Jesus come into my heart. He changed your life. We're looking up 
by faith now, not wondering, not trembling. We have certainty. Jesus is coming back for you soon. If you're willing to go, we'll all go one day together. What a day. A couple of years ago, I was in Guatemala. We traveled to a place where a volcano had just erupted and killed hundreds of people. Hundreds, maybe thousands. I met Rosa. Rosa was a volunteer whose role was to warn people to flee from volcanic activity. She told me with tears streaming down her face that in house after house, people said, all we're going to do is lock the doors, wait the volcano out. So many people died who knew that the volcano was erupting and that danger was headed their way. They died simply because they didn't move when they had the opportunity. Friend, right now is that time. The end of the world is coming. What's taking place all around us shows us prophecy is fulfilling. Where are you standing? Are you willing to move? Rosa wept. She appealed to people. She would go to house after house. you got to go. You can see the smoke. They say it's going to go. you got to run. Come to safety. Everyone could have been saved if only they'd moved. Jesus says, I'm coming back soon. Would you run to safety? I'll tell you where safety is. It's in the heart of Jesus. It's in looking towards heaven and saying, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I've got to give you the opportunity to tell God you're serious. You want to go to heaven. Send me a text message, would you? Here's the number, 423-264-2575. See it on the screen if you've got a screen. 423-264-2575. That's the number. Text me the word go. Don't do this on Facebook. Don't do this someplace online. Don't, pick, don't phone. Text 423-264-2575. Send the word go. I'll text you back. Click on the link. Click on the link. I know some people are doing it right now. Grab your phone. Grab your phone. 423-264-2575. Send me the word go. Click the link I send you. Point number one will say, I want to spend eternity with Jesus. Well, you know what to say. Number two, that'll be sent to you as soon as you fill out number one. Oh, no, it's right there on the card, isn't it? Number two, I want to follow Jesus' example and be baptized or rebaptized. If that's your desire, if you feel like God is calling you in that direction, just check right there. Boom. If you have questions you'd like to discuss, you let us know. Text me, please. You're going to send the word go to 423-264-2575. I'll send you a link. Click the link. Would you do that for me tonight? Make a decision for Jesus. Don't say, oh, I don't need to bother about it. You do. Heaven is real. You got to go. I want to spend eternity with Jesus. I want to follow Jesus' example and be baptized or rebaptized. I have questions I would like to discuss. And I want to pray with you now. Come on, let me pray with you. Father in heaven, lead us to make a decision for Jesus forever. We claim him and all of heaven's blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining me tonight. Tomorrow morning, our final presentation, 11 o'clock Eastern. Don't miss it. Tomorrow morning at 11, I share my testimony with you. It's going to be great. See you then on Hope Awakens.